I need props. <laughs> also, I need a script. I'm an introvert, but here I am. She stars in CTV's hit police drama Motive and is part of a, a show I absolutely love, The Killing. It is absolutely amazing. If you didn't see it, you can find it on the Netty Flicky thing, on the, on the Google Tron. A warm wel uh, welcome to Our Lady of the Second Half. Come on up here, my darling. Mr. Lehman. Thank you. I have my props. I'm gonna put, I'm an actress. I need props. Also, I need a script. I'm very, very impressed. None of the other tremendous speakers had a script, but I do. You will see my handshake. I'm an introvert, but here I am. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. This has just been the most heartwarming, thrilling, connected experience for me. And I, I just, I'm, yeah, I'm speechless. It's been wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am here tonight to talk about something I'm passionate about, something that is sacred and vital in my life, and that is my meditation practice. Um, the particular kind of meditation I do is formerly called Vipassana or insight meditation because the literal Pali, which is the original language um, of its name, is translated as inward eye, inward wisdom. Uh, the insight meditation that I do is often commonly referred to as practicing mindfulness, and I know you've all heard that word bandied about often. Um, it's also, as I said, until now been something that's been private in my life, so I I feel extremely vulnerable right now up here talking to you about it. Normally on set, I pretend to be someone else. I wear a wig, I've got a ton of makeup on, I wear clothes that are given to me, and I say words from other people. But tonight, this is me engaging with all of you, so I'm a little um, uh, nervous. Uh, um, in fact, I agreed uh, to come here at, at Mark's invitation. Um, to share this with you because I feel like this, what's happening right now, this tremendous heat of this moment, I'm incredibly nervous, you can see my hand shaking, all of you are there open and ready and I just want to hide, is the perfect metaphor for what it is that I do when I sit on the cushion, what any meditator does when they sit on the cushion or when they're aware in their life or when they're walking or when they're eating. And they're aware that contradictions can exist at the same time and make space for that in your world so you're not constantly reacting, um, that you give yourself a split second of choice. And that's something that can be cultivated. Often it's called cultivating a witness. And if I were to look down right now, I would tell myself to stop shaking. But um, at any rate, you're watching me right now engage in an intimate engagement with my nerves and my vulnerability coming up against the desire to share with you also. I meditate. Because like all of you, I am insane. <laughs> I am. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, I have a mind that whirls and schemes and blames and leaps and crafts and creates and talks to itself. I have found that the intentional daily act of sitting still and paying attention to my breath, the sensations in my body, allowing them to rise and fall away without judgment, if I can, directly correlates from my capacity for generosity, open-heartedness, forgiveness, and richer dialogues with the world around me. And for me, that directly inspires and influences my conduct. And that, to me, is extremely important. My conduct as a human being up here in front of all of you. My conduct as a mother, a wife, a daughter, a friend, again, as a human. That matters to me now more than ever. So one might also say that I meditate because it is the most radical political act that I can do. And it's interesting because I work in an industry that asks people to constantly look outside of themselves. You may not know that's what's happening when you are engaged and entertained and in in some cases, um, I'm pleased that the entertainment provides you with the nourishment you're looking for, but in most cases, it's, deli it's a delivery system asking you to look away from yourselves to a different standard of beauty or a different standard of intelligence or the cultural norms that usually benefit corporations or people that have larger control in the world to keep you distracted from how you actually feel, looking outside of yourself for answers. 
I know that all of you have heard the word meaning, mindfulness bandied about. It's really grown in popularity. Clearly, time is totally on board. Um, it, it's uh, obviously grown in popularity here in the West, largely due to its widespread acceptance in academia and in science and medicine. Now the delivery systems aren't people in for example, Buddhist robes bowing and formally practicing in front of you. It's being delivered through psychology. It's being delivered through hospice caregivers. Really, really, really important places. Meditation is now coming through. Uh, time, just had to do this one too. Um, uh, they're right on board. But when I sat down to say, what will I talk about with mindfulness? It's such an internal practice. How can I display it? And oh my god, I have slides. By the way, I have way too many slides, so I may just zip through them. Um, I got some really fantastic, entertaining, and misleading results when one Googles mindfulness. So let's just head right down Mindfulness Road. And first up, we have the very standard North American directive, be mindful, keep breathing. Did any of you forget to breathe? I don't need to be reminded to breathe. Next up, keep calm and be mindful. Well, frankly, screw you, poster, because often I am not calm when I am mindful, and I am mindful that I am not calm. So, go fuck yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry, Harrison. This is an R-rated movie you're allowed to go to tonight. <laughs> um, um, okay, so next, we have some good old-fashioned mindful consumerism. Oh, no, sorry, that's just a pleasant rainbow brain directive which is kind of cute, so I threw it in there. Mindful mints <laughs> will give you mindful breath. I guarantee it. You can have mindful hair. I don't know what that looks like, but hey, don't you want it? Uh, if you eat mindful snacks, you will be on the mindful diet. All of this, of course, following this co-opted North American consumer-based distraction asking you to step outside of yourself, which is, of course, not mindful. Oh, what up, what's up next? I really loved. Um, I said, hey, Pinterest, hey, Google, what does mindfulness look like if you meditate? And I call this series Wet Bum, but this first one I... <laughs> this, <laughs> this first one I like to call What the Actual Fuck. Like, <laughs> I'm going to put on my tunic and sit in the water <laughs> in a totally unsustainable pose. Anyway, I'm so sorry. In the park. To, in the, wherever. I don't know, in, there's a, whatever. So next up, we have a variety of silhouetted women, usually sitting in water. There's a close-up of sitting in water. Um, I've lost my post. But anyway, uh, lots of women sitting in water that just is not mindfulness. It's sort of um, this, all these images I put up there because I wanted to stress that this sort of spa-drenched, pseudo-sexualized image of meditation is just not meditation. Um, what meditation looks like to me can be encapsulated in the next several slides. This is my glorious and splendid teacher, Trudy Goodman, who heads up Inside LA. Um, it's a nonprofit uh, organization down in Los Angeles that is a Dharma center where people can come together and meditate and get guidance and instruction. Um, one of her colleagues, I'm not sure if anybody here has ever heard of John Kabat-Zinn, but he pioneered bringing um, uh, traditional insight meditation techniques to stress-reduced uh, scenarios. So, for example, people who are caregivers in hospitals can go through his um, stress management program using meditation to try to deal with extremely difficult circumstances. Um, I've had the pleasure of of calling these next people friends and um, guides. That's Trudy again with Jack Cornfield, who is also one of the preeminent teachers in um, the insight uh, meditation world. He, in fact, was one of the teachers who brought insight meditation from Burma to the West. He, Joseph Goldstein, and Sharon Salzberg, um, who you will also see a picture of. This is Michael Stone. We have the luxury of having Michael Stone live on Pender Island. That's him with his beautiful son, Olin. He is a tremendous teacher. Um, and if any of you have questions about these teachers, they're easily ac uh, accessible, and you can ask me about them later. A practical Western approach. Uh, for the most part, for them, insight meditation is the intersection between uh, responsibility for your own mind stream and psychology 
and that seems to be the way into Western culture. This last slide is of Sharon Salzberg, and about 11 years ago, um, that's when I came to Vipassana meditation. I was living in Los Angeles alone, uh, and it was a particularly dense and burdened time in my life, and I wanted and needed a way to cope and engage with fear, anxiety, anger, divorce, illness, family, etc. I'm sure none of you have had any of those things. Um, my personal method is to uh, retreat and become insular, uh, which I was finding increasingly unflexible and unsustainable. I wasn't able to engage, certainly in my profession, or in meaningful relationships in a way that I wanted to. So Sharon was reading, uh, leading a one-day uh, meditation retreat because she was promoting a book that had come out called Faith that she wrote about her teacher, Ram Das. And I went sort of sheepishly and I sat in the back and I, I found out about it through what was sort of their equivalent of Banyan books down in Los Angeles. And um, I went and I sat and I, I felt sort of fraudulent. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't bring a mat. Oh my God, everybody's got a cushion. I sat on the ground, it was so uncomfortable. Um, but one thing that she kept speaking of, she, she is, um, with Jack Kornfield, uh, two of the preeminent teachers that brought insight meditation, Vipassana meditation, to the West in the 70s. She came from India, Jack came from Burma, but um, she is the uh, leading teacher on what's called loving kindness, or metta in, in Sanskrit, but, um, or in the Buddhist world. So she speaks of meeting your limitations on the cushion, or however it is that you're meditating, um, with kindness. And that idea was incredible to me. Here I was wanting to be a kind person in the world, increasingly not feeling kind to myself or anybody else. So the concept of beginning, that kindness begins with an inward look to yourself, and can you meet those hot places, those ugly places, those messy places, those great places, with kindness? Uh, that was kind of mind-blowing to me. And I remember um, she said, um, ease. What does that feel like? Really feel it. That concept of ease, it was mind-blowing to me. The concept that I could feel ease by being honest with my dis-ease just felt so... Uh, revelatory to me, and that I didn't really have to do anything other than be willing to be intimately present with what was arising for me, not acting on it, just being present for it. To take it further, she, she would say that ease could be found in growing an awareness of the masks that we all wear to conceal our authentic selves. I'm almost finished. That's beautiful playing. Um, <laughs> sitting and not reacting to all of the masks in my life, which I felt so thickly identified with seemed impossible, but my desire and fear coexisted, much like it does right now. And meditation became a place where I could reliably, although not always comfortably, stop acting. This physical life asks us to take on tons of roles. You're many things to many people, and you're many things to yourself. But um, the opportunity to sit and reveal the masks and then reveal the authentic face comes with time and intention and dedication. And on that day, I formally meditated. But what I did and what Vipassana teaches is that you're simply breathing. The concept that you should be mindful, therefore be something other than just concentrating on your breath, the in and the out. Thoughts are going to arise. That's what the psychology of it's why your mind is there. It's a meaning making machine. But the concept that you could dwell with your contradictions or be in deeply heated, painful, ugly places with kindness is the most radical act you can offer yourself and the people in your lives. And over and over, we've heard about connection here tonight in various ways, in different language. I feel like it's a tremendously synchronistic group of people speaking. And um, if you're conscious, as I continue to try to be, that in any given circumstance, you are aware of what your best is. And I don't mean your best performance or your best... Um, grade or achievement. I mean, I'm nervous. I came up here. I know that that's my best because I know how, how nervous I feel. 
it allows me to understand that my life is not just my life. My life is you doing your best, too. And that means if I'm driving in the street and you cut me off, I don't immediately, I might feel put out, but I don't immediately think, that fucking asshole cut me off. I think, didn't know which way he was going, went quite quickly, whatever. <laughs> you know, like, the concept that I can see that you're doing your best allows much more spaciousness and kindness. And uh, that's why I sit. And I had intended to sit with you, but we don't have enough time, so I encourage you at least to just give yourself if you can do it, a minute, five minutes, where you just follow your breath. Thank you. You have to rush, Sean. Sit down for a minute, if you can. Slides, there's so many more slides. Look at all that. Oh, so, hey, let's go back to that. There, we'll leave it on this one, there. So here, we three could not possibly be more different. <laughs> Did you see that reoccurring theme that I just went oh, to? God. But we have something in common. We do. We, 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 oh, we, yeah, we do. We three are those strange kids at the back of the class. I was at the front. <laughs> or the front. And if somebody put a picture of Barbara Streisand on a screen, he would probably be thinking of a million ways to make a robot that was Barbara Streisand, where the nose was perfect and she still went like this. And she would want to be Barbara Streisand. But can anyone really be her? And I would want to be Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and I think what you were talking about is sometimes when you have those creative, artsy people, there's a lot going on upstairs. There's a few uh, splinters in the windmills that are our minds. And sometimes you have to hush yourself. And sometimes we all have to hush ourselves because there's so much going on and there's everything going on around you and then there's everything going on inside you, and then those things collide. And sometimes when you're about to go, ah, you just have to take it down a little and hush yourself. I think that's what you were. If you can. If you can. Yeah. And, and usually it's not in circumstances where it's extremely heated. That's unrealistic to think that you'll be able to control everything in that way. But if you have a private time in a private space, then try and find a puddle to sit in. Yeah, sit in water. <laughs> sit in the water Wearing in the middle white. of the Stanley yeah. Park with a. <laughs> but you see, I think it's a better thing though than the yoga because the yoga for me, I cannot get into the position, and if I could, I would never get back up again. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I want to thank you both for being here. I think that was actually uh, interesting to have you two uh, close to each other. I think there's similar journeys. Yeah, different. So thank you for being here to both of you and thank you for your fascinating Thank you. Story.